What's up, y'all? So, I oftentimes talk about the military-industrial complex. Okay, that was a term coined by a former president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, in his farewell address, um, where he said, be wary of the military-industrial complex. And he was talking about um, these private interest groups that contract with the government, right? So, like, when we go back to the Iraq uh, war or Operation Iraqi Freedom, right? <laughs> uh, and we talk about companies like Blackwater USA, all right? Uh, and then Russia has their own kind of equivalent of Blackwater USA, which is also a private uh, a mercenary group, security defense contractor known as the Wagner Group, okay? And these are all entities, doesn't matter what country they're affiliated with or uh, pledge their allegiance to, um, they're playing on this um, kind of global field. Um, and so they profit from war. It doesn't matter. These are all not very good people. And, and you know, they're just as bad as all the other government contractors um, that uh, are arms dealers, right? We go after arms dealers, don't we? I mean, isn't that what we do? Isn't that we go after all of these people that we accuse of terrorism and supplying weapons to um, all these bad people in the world? And then oftentimes, we're the ones that finance them. Okay? It was Al-Qaeda that was created by the Central Intelligence Agency and used against the Soviets in Afghanistan during the Cold War and up until the 1990s. All right? Um... And former President George W. Bush uh, uh, started his first oil company with money he got from the Bin Laden group. This is, this is your fact. This isn't me saying this. Day. <laughs> so the point being is, is that um, the military-industrial complex is what has militarized our police force in America. All right, this is a nonpartisan issue. This is not. A, this is not about defunding the police or funding the police. And we've become divided by these private interest groups. And while we're all fighting, it doesn't stop because nobody's um, being like a, a proactive socially in their community and getting the word out. We're not really educating ourselves. I mean, everybody just kind of gets behind the nonprofit organization and, and you know, kind of like protests. And it, it really doesn't matter because uh, nowadays, uh, even um, um, a peaceful protest is seen as insightful by the uh, law enforcement community. All right, and I want folks in law enforcement to know that you're being used, you're being played. I have law enforcement experience, okay? So I can say that I'm qualified to speak on this matter. And then so many folks out there get into this adversarial mindset, especially when you're in law enforcement, that whole like us versus them like, uh, <laughs> mentality. We've seen this with the BLM protests. We had folks that were... Um, BLM protesters, social uh, activists, and law enforcement was shunning the BLM movement. We had uh, sheriffs like uh, Sheriff uh, in Nevada, uh, who's with the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, Dan uh, Coverly, all right, who who told BLM protesters or people that support BLM to not call his agency if they need police help you know but I mean the point is is that when you're a sworn officer that's not your job is to be biased even if people don't like you if people don't that's your job you're, sometimes your job is to serve those that don't like you that's what it is you don't like the job don't be sheriff but the point being is is that everybody's getting played and the U.S. has been militarized or the U.S. police force and it's by design, logistically. So we got into all these wars. Most of them have been phony wars. We, the United States has not been in a legitimate war since World War II. Okay? All right? And that's simply put. Everything has had an ulterior motive afterwards. 
we're trying to take on all these fights and police the world. And the point being is, is that um, all this surplus military equipment, similar to how the U.S. took the surplus guns and exchanged those surplus weapons for cocaine during the Contras in South America and then imported that cocaine into the um, minority communities in the, in the U.S. and in the process destroyed Mexico, right? In terms of the kind of violence and, and, uh, and gang activity or DTO, drug trafficking organizations, activities that were a result of the narcotics trade. So it's all of this surplus military equipment that's being uh, brought back to the United States and under government grants, um, uh, law enforcement agencies can get this surplus military equipment to use against the public. That's why they have all the Humvees and MRAPs and you, you, well, you, that's what SWAT has, right? They get that from the military. I, I know, I've undergone the training, okay? So I, I know where most of this equipment is coming from and they're gonna use that against the public and, and it's wrong because if the public just sits back and is complacent, you know, and we're fighting over everything like we have been and, and allowing for these people to continuously divide us. So this is what's going to happen. We're going to have complete chaos. And then, I mean, the police force is already there. It doesn't matter. All right. And now it's a matter of national security. Now it's a matter of um, you could be a domestic terror group. And there are domestic terror groups out there, but the point being is, is that much of this is exaggerated, kind of like the wars that we go into, all right? We were sending uh, security defense contractors like Blackwater, okay, to the Middle East. And then we had that Raven 23 incident, all right, where Blackwater didn't have the licensing from the Iraqi government, okay, to be in that area. They weren't, they weren't, they didn't have the security licensing to be, and was, was set a, to be a green zone, all right? And basically, um, uh, during that Raven 23 incident, um, there was a security convoy uh, present in that region, and s some of the Blackwater uh, security staff decided to to light up the surrounding area with gunfire because they felt that was a necessity. At that point, it was a tactical decision. And innocent civilians, including children, were hurt as a result of. So all I'm saying is, is that we have people that are provocateurs. That's what they do, all right? And security contractors are often used to create provocations overseas because public can't confirm any of this, right? These are security defense contractors working for the Central Intelligence Agency. That's not to say all of the CIA is bad, but you have people that are running their own programs and the federal government that are not telling the public what they're doing. They're just trying to create war. This is all a game to them. And they're friends with uh, DynCorp and Halliburton um, and all of these um, big security defense contractors. Um, Lockheed Martin, okay? Their business is war. Their business is to sell more equipment. That's what they do, all right? And so when other countries see the U.S. as oppressive, which we are, or Russia as an oppressor, which they are, because everybody has their own agenda, governments don't really serve the public anymore. In that sense, when we're talking about warfare, militarily speaking, they're not serving the best interest of the public. The civilian population um, is seen as a kind of hindrance to our uh, operations, militarily speaking, that we've got going on overseas. All right, and then so do we want to provoke attacks here domestically? Because there's, and then so you have guerrilla warfare and you have governments taking advantage of this. Okay, I'm not just picking on the US government and the Chinese government is doing this and so are the Russians. And then so you have these people that are vested 
in the military industrial complex and that's why all these wars are going on it's not most people in america most civilians and government employees in the u.s don't want war right they're, they're not after the public okay and, and and i believe that to be worldwide most people don't want war but you have certain people that are playing on the global front and they oftentimes finance both sides of a war as they did with uh, during world war ii when George W. Bush's uh, grandfather, Prescott Bush, uh, helped finance the Germans. Uh, wh where's the DOJ? <laughs> where's their special investigations unit on that? that? That's where the war crimes are. What are you people doing? All right, so that's what I'm talking about. Is nobody wants to go after these people because of their affiliation, globally speaking. But at this point... Um, we know who the military industrial complex is, all right? And all of this technology that we're developing um, that's used by police is developed overseas. That's what they do. New technology is tested overseas. And then they bring it back to the U.S. domestically uh, and then use that technology on the civilian population. And via government grants and contracts, give this um, to your local uh, police departments and law enforcement agencies. But who's causing the provocation? Who's provoking all this? It was kind of like when we had those protests back in 2019, 2020, uh, in response to the, all the police brutality that was going on nationwide. And you had folks protesting nationwide. They were protesting and then uh, they caught police officers like starting fires. They were going around starting fires trying to make it look like it was the public to like set up a perimeter or whatever. That, that's what they used as justification. That came out. But the point being is, is that it's not the public. All right. You, got the, you have people in the government locally and at a state level, but... You, you got to start evaluating these police departments. A majority of the police force is former military. I'm not saying that military folks are, are, are bad or, in that sense, but their thinking is much different. You know, you, you, can't, you can't take that um, military strategy and mentality and apply that domestically on a civilian population. You just can't. It doesn't work. That's not what policing is about. And policing, most police organizations, if not all, uh, that I'm familiar with, they have a paramilitary structure. All right? Police organizations have a paramilitary structure. I know. I have worked for a paramilitary organization. All right, so the way that they're designed, there's a certain chain of command that resembles the military. But you don't use that on the civilian population. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about the military-industrial complex. Uh, and then the wall or the stone wall that was responsible um, for 9-11 in terms of information sharing if anybody that's not familiar with the term the stonewall uh, that refers to information sharing efforts between the domestic law enforcement and intelligence communities um, and the intelligence community abroad so if it wasn't for that 9-11 could have potentially been prevented because investigators uh, and intelligence um, officials domestically in the U.S. had certain information that they couldn't corroborate because the intelligence community abroad didn't want to provide that information. Because that information was on a need-to-know basis. So after 9-11, uh, information sharing efforts um, within the law enforcement and intelligence community in the U.S., went from need to know to need to share in response to uh, terrorism. But the point being is, is that this is what we have, all right? So 
I'm trying to save the world. I'm not trying to cause any provocations. War is no good for anybody. I want everybody to come together and say, hey, let's hold our communities accountable. Let's um, hold our public officials responsible, okay? When they're elected and they don't follow through with all this political rhetoric, hey, that's too bad. But we don't need you as our public officials, all right? If you've got friends um, or lobby groups that you're, that's your audience, um, whom you're serving and not the public, we don't need those types of public officials. We don't need public officials that, you know, favor the military industrial complex and not the community. That's where you should be reallocating all those funds is locally, not to start more wars, defense. Well, you, we have the largest, more, most powerful military in the world in the United States. What, what do you, how much more, what else do you need? The U.S., has been used, we've been played, we've been conned by the military industrial complex, all right? And many of these government contractors, security defense contractors, if they're not like DynCorp and Halliburton, um, who is directly connected to uh, former Vice President Dick Cheney, um, then those GSA contractors are foreign companies, they're not even, they're not even based in the U.S., kind of like our physical access control systems. Those physical access control systems that we have at the U.S. Department of Defense, at the Pentagon, at the U.S. Department of Justice, at all the federal courthouses, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, all the airports, those systems are not manufactured in the U.S. We get those physical access control systems from outside the U.S., from Europe, who gets much of their supply from China. But the point is, is that we don't even manufacture anything anymore. I mean, our physical access control systems are compromised here domestically at government facilities, at a federal level, state, and locally. Companies like Ademia, Schlumberger Sema, Hid Global, to name a few. Those are all European-based companies. All right? So, hey, I just want y'all to know that. And then so uh, stay informed, stay educated. Um, hit that like button, comment, subscribe. Um, follow me on Twitter. Subscribe to my podcast. Thank you for tuning in and until next time.